Yeah, I think it's a reset. I think if in the future it continues to be successful and let's say, uh, you know, who knows, someday, and I'm not, don't, on you nerds out there, don't take what I'm saying seriously. PUBG 2 comes out, right? I'm not, I, I have, oh, I actually I'm think not that'll trying, probably happen. It has to. It you will happen. You heard it here. Half-Life yeah. 3 and PUBG 2. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Half-Life 3. It's announced right here. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is going to be our first video episode of the Tasis Podcast. This was an interview I did with Paper Thin. If you guys have been following since the beginning, he was our first guest on. He's had a really interesting year covering PUBG uh, on mobile and on PC, traveling around the world. We also talked about uh, the state of WCS and Blizzard and StarCraft and StarCraft II. I thought it was fitting to bring him back onto the show um, since we started with him with audio initially. Now we're going to start with him with video. I've also got an announcement to make. I will be going to Tokyo uh, for Evo to interview players down there. Right now, we don't have any StarCraft going on uh, in this month. So since I've got some downtime and some, you know, you know, got nothing else going on, I might as well fly out there and see what's going on down in Japan. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. If you guys want to support what we're doing here at the Tasteless Podcast, uh, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Tasteless Podcast. Making a show like this isn't free. We've also upgraded what we're giving away here. Um, we're going to have a new tier for Patreon supporters. We have our own Discord, and we've got new Patreon goals, including a video episode with Artosis. And if we get high enough, um, some video episodes with Day 9, where we will fly him out to our studio. So if you can, please support us at patreon.com forward slash Tasteless Podcast. And without further ado, our first video episode with Paper Thin. All right. Thank you for doing this, man. Of course. Um, you were my first guest in the very first podcast. It was audio only. So I thought it was only fitting to have you come in here uh, on the video podcast. Yeah. Um, so we, this is a little bit under a year ago, right? When we last talked. Yeah. Just it was April of 2019 and so a lot's happened in PUBG. can you kind of get us up to speed on everything that's going on right now yeah sure sure so um people who are into PUBG esports already probably know but you know and people on the periphery kind of probably don't exactly have a great idea of what's going on um it wasn't a great year for PUBG esports to be frank the league system they put into place um didn't work out so we had four like majors they called them classics last year and as i was talking to you about because i was doing the first one uh, it's called the face of global summit and then uh they have a league in between each classic to like qualify for these classics and then you know the big end of the year event which is the PUBG global championship um all of that leads up to that the problem was was that the leagues just weren't doing very well it's just a lot we weren't of doing well as far as like viewership or, right. or players viewership. or okay viewership there's really there's like a, a lot of really talented players across a bunch of different regions. I mean, right now, Europe, uh, China, and Korea all have like really, really strong teams that could come in and compete for these championships. So it isn't a lack of players. There's plenty of talent. It's it's just a lot of PUBG. I think at the end of the day, like you're doing like like the Europe League, for example, is doing 96 games of PUBG. In and so, so when, when you're saying a league, you mean like. Um there was a regular show that was going on, for instance, in Europe. I know that there was one in Korea. I got to cast that with you for a little bit. Yeah. Um, on top of these major tournaments, the four that were coming out, right? Right, exactly. Exactly. It's very similar. It's a pro league system, right? There were PUBG official leagues, right? And there was one in Europe, one in America, one in Korea, one in China, one in Japan. There was an SEA one and a Latin America one. And I think... There's, I'm pro somebody's going to get mad at me because I'm forgetting one. more one. somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, they were all over the world, right? Literally all over the world. And um, it's just a lot of PUBG. I mean, it's, you know, Korea played 48 games in a, se in a season. Like, there are three seasons, right? Or phases is what they called them. And it's just a lot. I, it's, it, they're, you know, it's three days a week, for, for example, in Korea. Three days a week, four games a day. And that takes about three and a half hours. So it's, it's pretty long. It's not, you know, super... It's not longer than like a normal sports game, for example, like a bas an NBA yeah, game, a baseball or game, like, or something like that. Yeah, it's pretty comparable to that. But at the end of the day, it is it is a lot to take in. And where PUBG was finding success was in the bigger events, the the global events. Like the PUBG Nations Cup was actually our biggest event. It was like a like a World Cup style thing where each region got to bring their four best players or the 16 countries and I should how, say. how long does that one how long does that event last is that a few weeks or is that just over a weekend that was three days yeah over days. a weekend okay. basically weekend event, basically right right and so you're doing like six games a day and that takes about five hours or so five to six hours depending on how much filler you're doing with like analyst desk and all that other stuff 
So the PUBG Nation Cup, which was 16 different countries, got to bring their four best or voted on players, however they wanted to do it. And that was our most popular event, like, by far, last year. And it was really, really cool, and it was really fun. It was here in Seoul, Korea. And um, yeah, I got to cast that, too, you know, it was, and it was just a blast. I mean, it was people were loving it. The crowd was great here in Korea. Like, the fans were going nuts. I mean, it helps that one of the best players in the world is Korean, so that, that definitely hypes things up. But. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely tend to dominate anything they're playing. And um, you had this crazy year. You kind of went from, like, zero to hero. Uh, <laughs> You've been traveling all over the world. Um, you got to cast the global finals, the yeah. final round. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, PUBG is still a really popular game, especially in Asia, but it's still big globally, like uh, Europe and NA. Um, but it seems like it's in a weird spot now. Like we're here in 2020. Um, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't appear that they're going to be doing. Uh, the same kind of league format at all. Right. And there's been this exodus of uh, the esports people that were in charge of PUBG. Correct. So, um, obviously, this is a weird position for you uh, as someone who wants to cast PUBG and, and cover that as much as possible, whether it's you know in South Korea or anywhere in the world. So, what does this mean for, for PUBG going forward? Is this something people should be worried about, or is this is everything actually fine and it's just a change of scenery? Um, I think people should be a little worried. I'm a little worried, um, and not. I think there's still plenty of potential for PUBG, and I think it's going to just take people to kind of like figure out what exactly the best model is going to be for how the esports is organized because the league system just wasn't it just wasn't viable it just wasn't going to work for PUBG it's not like it doesn't have that tremendous amount of viewership support that something like League of Legends has that can just prop up a league system because like League of Legends can they have enough viewership right that their their leagues can be pretty pretty consistent and do well whereas PUBG just didn't have that yet so I think we I think maybe there was just a little bit of a you, you want to model the best, right? You want to model League of Legends as where you want to take your eSport. And I think that's what PUBG tried to do. And it just didn't work out. So now people are leaving. They're cutting, but they're scaling back on the funding. And they're, instead of, like, the leagues are just kind of allowed to kind of do whatever they want now in terms of, like, their format and everything. Like, there is no more, like, overarching, like, rule set. Like, we had a rule set for the whole system. That is kind of gone. Uh, most leagues are probably going to not change a lot, like, at all, really, um, except for like some of them are going to have like open qualifiers and like online qualifiers and some things like that. So it's going to look different for that. Um, but yeah, they're still going to be four major again, events again, but they're going to be bigger. So instead of like a short weekend event, they might span it out over a couple weeks and really give like these big tournaments like more time to kind of flesh themselves out because a lot of the complaints from players when they come to these big events is they don't have enough games to really kind of balance things out, right? You play like 140 games of baseball in a year because there's some randomness, some variation, and you want to show over a course of time that you are the best, you know, in, in, a, in, in a, you know, playoff format, it's a little different, right? You need, you have that shorter period of time, and that's kind of what makes it exciting, but the players would like more time to kind of flesh things out. It seemed like League built their way into that, right? Yes. League is 11 years old now. I mean, they didn't have um, a, a, a major tournament system right away. I mean, they were outsourcing that early on, because I know I, we were having League paired next to StarCraft at MLGs, right? like way long ago. Um, I wonder if they maybe dove in too quickly for a game that probably maybe needed more organic time to build as an eSport. Uh, do, do you think that's correct? Yeah, I think it is. And I think in general, like, I think people are finding when they're when they're fans of PUBG when like the big events are super exciting and super fun. <clears throat> and I think that's what really they want that like because like the, it kind of drags on like these leagues there's three big seasons of these leagues and it's just it's too much right now like people aren't kind of fully invested in the esport yet and that's a huge commitment to make as a fan right you only have so much time right time is your most valuable commodity as a person and you got to build this you know naturally organically whereas this system was just kind of like and, and i 
totally 100% get what PUBG is doing and appreciate it because they really, really tried to make this eSport a thing. Like, they gave it a ton of money, a ton of money, hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars, and a ton of effort to try to make it happen. And, you know, it just didn't work out for various reasons. And I think a lot of people should be more appreciative of that. Like, if you're yeah. a fan of – like, I see a lot of fa players and fans of PUBG who are kind of very negative and very sour right now. And I think they should look back on 2019 and say, well, we tried. And we gave it one hell of an effort. Do you think they did it right, though? Um, I mean, granted, yeah. I mean, they spent a lot of money. This is also typical of every every new game when they're trying to dive into esports. E they're they're dumping a lot of money. Do you feel like it was uh, handled in the correct way? I mean, certainly there had to be some some bloat somewhere in there or, or some unnecessary spending, right? Yeah. If you asked me at the time of our last podcast we did together yeah i would have said they're absolutely doing the right thing i mean in retrospect yeah it wasn't the right thing but i was yeah. on board with it i thought it was a good idea i thought like all right let's really give this a shot let's do this league format and like let's see where this goes but it, it's it's kind of feeling like it's going to be and this is a lot of esports in general the league formats just aren't viable they're just not going to work yeah there's only a few that can make it work starcraft being one of them because of the way it has to go well, the StarCraft League formats, I mean, it's kind of a very weird situation in that everybody that's good, for the most part, is in South Korea. They're either Korean or they're uh, residing out here. So, like, doing GSL is actually, like, not that expensive, right. right? Like, a lot of these other leagues, they have to house the players in, like, a hotel for some time and then um, fly them out and have handlers for them. And then think about that with PUBG. Yeah. That's 16 teams minimum. Yeah, 64 players plus staff, you know, coaches, managers, all that other stuff. You got to provide them food. You got to provide them housing of some kind. Usually that's going to be a hotel. You got to basically book out an entire fucking hotel. And yeah. that's a ton of money. So the best I think what PUBG has learned is, and I I'm fully on board with this now. Of course, I say that. And um, is that the bigger events? That's where you just got to put all your your it's it's more. It's more cost effective to put all of your kind of eggs in these one baskets because you're saving money over time because you're paying hotels for four weeks, four to six weeks, depending on which league you are in, yeah. for 64 players. That's, inc that's insane. Well, this is a problem with team games in general is that everything costs way more. Everything is much, much harder to do. Fighting games, um, RTS games, anything that's one-on-one, -on -one, it's much more self-sustainable. I mean, the StarCraft model... Uh, StarCraft 1 or StarCraft 2 out here in Korea, it's so much cheaper. It, it's just, it's so much more doable. Like, we don't even pay for the players to come to the venue. I mean, they take the train or, or take a taxi or something like that. So you think uh, if they switch to, like, a four-major uh, event format, right. which is actually pretty typical for a lot of games, is there's some kind of major event somewhere. Uh, four usually seems to be the number. Yeah. Make it seasonal. And then um, and put them in there. Do you think that can rejuvenate uh, the PUBG scene? Because, and this is at least from my perspective, because StarCraft had this a lot early on at the start of it, um, was market confusion, where there was too many fucking events mm. everywhere. Like right when StarCraft 2 came out and it was all over the place, there were, you know, sometimes three major tournaments in a weekend. Um, if you're going to follow PUBG and you don't know where you're supposed to go or who you're supposed to watch, it can be hard to actually keep up as a fan. Yeah, I I hope I hope it's better. Um, this also opens the doors for uh, kind of what you're talking about, the possibility of other organizations running their own PUBG events. They don't. There's no restriction anymore that it has to be like PUBG funded and PUBG controlled. PUBG is getting very hands off with this kind of. Um, when I was listening to your uh, your podcast with Moses, the CS:GO caster, yeah. um, it's kind of more similar. Going to be a little more similar to that now, where PUBG is getting very hands off and they're letting these other organizations say, if you want to run your own tournament with whatever rules, that's that's great. Go ahead, and you, we're going to see that here. Actually, there's an event coming up. Um, by the time your viewers hear it, it'll be already happened. But there's a there's a it's called the Smash Cup. Um, it's going to be actually a joint venture between OGN and Afrika TV. Um, it's just like a four-day little tournament. But it has a unique rule set that's going to be different than the normal style. So you're going to see some of these events crop up. And it gives, I think, some room for creativity to try and find what's going to work. And I think this is... Because this is what worked for PUBG Esports in the beginning, when PUBG didn't even have an esports department or anything like that people were just making their own events and they were getting really popular and they were you know profitable and then you know i mean 
PUBG, of course, said, okay, well, we this is our eSport. We should do something with right. this. And they really did try. I mean, it's not like they just walked into it and tried to smash it. They were trying to prop it up and make it even bigger. And it just wasn't successful. So now they're, you know, kind of retooling things and rethinking things. Um, so I think I think it's got a chance. I mean, of course, I want it to succeed because I love PUBG and I love doing it. Um, I think people like as time goes on will learn that there's a way to watch PUBG and you because you need to. This is kind of funny to say, but you kind of have to have two monitors. Like you have to have one oh, monitor yeah. for one the main the screen and, and one with the map <laughs> yeah. because you need to know what's going on. And you can watch your own teams. Like most most uh, tournaments now will let you watch a particular team's feed, so you can watch your favorite team if you just want to watch them and see what they're doing. So maybe. Even three monitors would be good, but it, it is. But most people have two monitors these days, right? Yeah. So it's it's very watchable. But is it? It, it is. You need to be invested in it when you're watching it because you can't really not pay attention because like the moment you stop paying attention, all of a sudden like two teams are dead and you're like, oh, what happened? I don't know. Yeah, a lot of people were very. Um, well, they were definitely questioning: Is this possible to spectate at all? I, honestly, I was one of them. Personally, I thought, okay, there's so much going on here. I, I found it; it's actually pretty fun to watch PUBG. Yeah. Um, there's definitely a lot going on. It seems like it's probably the hardest game to produce for, oh, especially in game. Um, it, it, it's totally crazy, but it, it does seem like it's actually, uh, as far as because there's a lot of esports that I honestly have a hard time watching. This seems to be more of a, one Same. of them. Yeah, one of the more watchable ones. I think it's you know it's really funny like. I've shown this game to a lot of different friends and family yeah. who and aren't into esports. Maybe this is because it's based in reality yeah. as well. Like it's actually guns and abandoned cars and houses and there's no it's, you know, you dragons under, it's easy and to understand magic what's items. going on. Yeah. And once you explain the basic concept, well, there's 16 teams, they can all drop anywhere on this map, and then there's a circle that forces them together, yeah. and they have to fight over territory. Bam. People are like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And they watch it. I mean, my parents came to the PUBG Global Championship, which was super cool of them. Um, and they got to, you know, listen to me cast, like, my voice over the, the stadium and stuff. So that was pretty special. And uh, my dad, like, he was like, oh, I get it. He's like, I understand why this is a thing. He's yeah. like, this is actually really cool once you kind of understand what's going on. Yeah, it's it definitely seems to translate pretty well um, just into to like the basic viewer. Um, so it, is it possible for there to be a league system that would come into place later? It seems like not just uh, PUBG Corp, but a lot of these companies tend to jump the gun. Um, I think we're seeing a little bit of this with Overwatch. We're going to see exactly what the future of that game is. But right. um, it's almost like they're trying to force a whole format upon everybody out of nothing. And maybe that's part of the problem. Do you feel like this is almost a reset point, or is this like a new format they should try to follow uh, going forward? Yeah, I think it's a reset. I think if in the future it continues to be successful, and let's say, uh, you know, who knows, someday, and I'm not, don't, you nerds out there, don't take what I'm saying seriously. PUBG 2 comes out, right? I'm not, I, I have. Oh, I actually I'm think that'll trying, probably happen. It has to. It you will heard happen. it here. Half Life yeah, 3 and PUBG 2. Is, yeah, Half Life 3. It's <laughs> announced right here. <laughs> No, um, and I have. I'm not trying to like leak anything. I actually have no. Idea. I've never heard any rumors of that sort. I actually figured they were probably gonna have a PUBG too. There has or to. something. There has to be something like that. It's still a pretty janky game at times. There's still. Yeah. We did have one moment during the World Championship where there used to be this bug in the game where cars would just kind of take off and fly oh, up they in just the flip air. Off. Yeah, they yeah, just flip just, off the just level. Go into yeah. space. We had that happen at the Global Championship. One of the uh, one of the <laughs> NA teams. They were driving into a building, and this is like this is one of these weird physics glitches that happens, and it doesn't happen very much anymore in PUBG. To be yeah. to be completely fair, they basically eradicated this bug, except for very weird circumstances that a guy drove into the side of a, a house and just hit it at a funny angle and the car just poof, right up into the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's to me it's kind of funny, but and the player fortunately took it in good nature. We started calling him Rocket Man. It was the nickname <laughs> we gave him. Um, it, but it, it, yeah, just to, just to say on, the, on that note here for a second with PUBG 2, because this is actually happening. Um, I mean, Fortnite 2, is, right? Did they announce Fortnite 2? Is it? Is it? Can you, can, Ryan, Ryan, can you check this? I, I thought... I know that there's Overwatch 2, which appears like almost to be DLC. Like it's not actually a new game, but it's like a campaign or something that they're it's releasing. It's a single out there. player thing, I think, or is like a co-op. It's a co-op thing, I think. Co-op thing, okay. I think. Yeah. But is it Fortnite 2? Is there something for that? Yeah, Fortnite Chapter 2. Okay, Fortnite oh, chapter, chapter 2. Okay. So I mean, maybe they could do a PUBG 2. I would imagine though, if they had to do a, a like a second PUBG game, it would need to be in a new engine though. 
That's what I'm hoping. Doesn't it seem like... I would prefer I mean, that. I'm not a programmer, but it seems to me that the engine is so janky that yeah, it, I mean, it's it preventative was, it for, was for competition. It was built by a very small team of people, right? Brendan Green It's is, the Unreal engine, right? Yeah, I think it's Unreal. I think it's Unreal 4, if I'm not mistaken. You should check that. <laughs> Double check that. <laughs> I, fake news out people there. People are going to be like, Clinton doesn't know anything. I'm like, I know. Uh, so... Yeah, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, I would like to see them just as long as they keep the gunplay mechanics. Like that's what makes PUBG special, right? Is how hard it is to control those guns. It, that's what makes it really fun. Yeah, the, the guns are not control. like lasers, right? I mean, no. you actually yes. Unreal Engine Four. Unreal yeah. Engine Four. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, you were saying you know using uh, the the gun control or having. Or like I guess recoil control, yeah. Um, or the fact that when you fire a bullet, it actually has to go through the air and then it, and then yeah, there's, eventually there's bullet hit. drop and a trajectory and all that yeah. other kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's what makes it super fun. Like when you see players that are able to recoil, you know, control the recoil so well that they can keep a point, like with a gun with a full, you know, automatic spray. Yeah, and they can keep it almost pinpoint. Like that's so hard to do. Like you watch them as they move their hand across, and they're doing like they're doing this. Like across the mouse, and like like they have huge mouse pads for PUBG because yeah. you need so much room to move your mouse around to control the recoil. So in terms of like technical skill, it's one of the one of the hardest games out there, and that's why it's well, frankly a lot of people find it kind of frustrating because it's hard. Yeah, it's it's very different from Fortnite, and I'm not saying that Fortnite's easy because I feel like it's almost even though I think aesthetically it can look like it's the same game, yeah. but this one's more I guess. More like white and green, and you know, more colorful stuff. And PUBG's, uh, I think, a more of a gritty-looking game. Um, there are a lot of differences in that. Do, do you feel like uh, PUBG and Fortnite are in direct competition with each other? Is there a similarity to like uh, the League of Legends, Dota rivalry here? Um, um, yeah, I, I think there is. I think some people might even disagree that there is necessarily I, a rivalry with Dota and League of Legends. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. I think there has to be. I think all the battle royales are kind of c competing with each other, including Apex Legends, um, yeah. to kind of keep a player base. And now there's all kinds of different battle royales coming out. I mean, in, there's. There was like Realm Royale, which was like a third person, almost like World of Warcraft looking kind of, uh, you had like spells and stuff. And there's a, there's one coming out. I can't remember the name of it, but you're like, it's like a battle royale with mages. You're like a mage and you have to like cast spells and it's like mage royale. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nuts. It's so like, there's all these different battle royales coming out and I think they are kind of all in competition with each other. Just like, just like uh, CSGO and call of duty and rainbow six siege are all kind of in competition with each other. There's only, you know, as a, as a fan or something, you've only got, unless you're like really rich or just, you know, uh, you know, a shut in in your house, you only have so much time to <laughs> <Or> watch <both. laughs> esports or yeah. both. Yeah. And so like, you have to kind of pick and choose like your yeah. favorite type of game and which one of those. So yeah, there is definitely some competition. But that being said, Fortnite and PUBG are extremely different games and both great in their own way. Like Fortnite is hard because of the building aspect. Yeah, I can't wrap my head around that stuff sometimes. Where I watch it and I'm like, what are they thinking? Like, how do they that quickly like design a structure in their head? I mean, obviously it's practice. It's, it's and, insane. No, yeah. it's it's crazy and it's very very different because the, the bullets, um, I'd say, are much cleaner in yeah. Fortnite, but it's much less about just being a shooter as it is trying to manipulate an environment and navigate that. But Fortnite, from everything that I understand, is not actually massively, it's not huge globally. No, the way that, that just that in the PUBG, Western world. This is a, a misconception. Um, I mean, a lot of people that are watching this are probably Americans or, or some Europeans. And so there's a big problem with uh, people in gaming in general where they project what their experience is in their game onto the entire world where china alone and PUBG, it's not just that there's a lot of people in china like PUBG's fucking massive it's huge in china. china um in korea it's still huge in the pc uh cafes you go to a pc cafe i'd say maybe like a third of everybody is playing PUBG. maybe yeah a fourth it's going down overwatch day. did uh take like the number oh, two it. spot again so it's league of legends number one overwatch has been number two again and uh pubg went down to number three but yeah it's still quite popular in the pc cafes you'll still see people playing it um and it's huge here in asia people have to that's where people have to kind of go well okay you look at like the concurrent players we're still like on steam alone hundreds of thousands and not many games can have that claim where there's that many concurrent player pretty much all the time and that's just on steam and a lot of these countries don't use steam china doesn't use yeah. steam korea doesn't use steam right all these other countries have their own launchers for PUBG. you know here in korea it's cacao i don't know what they use in china but 
It, it, you, it's, I don't know. It, I think some Steam, but uh, there's other launchers as well. Yeah, I think Steam is trying to pitch something to China where it's like their Chinese Steam, but it's very limited in the games, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure. But yeah, I mean, everybody uses different launchers, basically. Right, right. So people have to kind of take that as it is. Because Fortnite, nobody plays it here in Asia. It is not People don't thing. even know about it out here. No. Yeah. They tried to... You remember they had that, like, that Chris Pratt? That fucking Chris Pratt commercial <laughs> just made me want to kill myself. It's like Chris Pratt talking <laughs> shit to Koreans in this commercial um, about a game they don't play. Did you see it's the like, one? It's like a, it's like a guy... Uh, in India on an American commercial talking shit on Americans because they suck at cricket. We're like, we don't even fucking play that game. Right. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, they, they had a, a pretty cringy attempt to try to penetrate the um, a Korean market. It didn't... Did you uh, see the, the one where it was, like, Chris Pratt's, like, mouth over a door and it was, like, a Fortnite thing? No, oh, my I did not God. See this. Really? They had, it was... It, it's, it, this got so crazy, like... It wasn't a bad pick to pick Chris Pratt. I feel like everybody likes Chris Pratt, but... I don't know. There's something about if you don't play Fortnite and seeing people do Fortnite dances that just... Oh, it's so... It, oh. it's a Every time I see just, somebody yeah, start yeah. flossing, I'm like, no. Yeah, just there was somebody no. in the marketing campaign at Epic that just really thought that was like... <laughs> it's just it's just not, not cool. Um, but yeah, that hasn't really taken off, uh, at least in Asia. If, as far as I understand, I mean, people can tweet at me really. if I'm wrong with, with the data, but as far as I understand, it's not taken off at all. Um, are, are they... Since these games do compete against each other, are they doing something right that PUBG Corp is not? That well, Fortnite had a couple things going for it from the get-go. A, it is pretty cartoony. Uh, and so that really engaged a younger audience. So they have a strong support coming from that. And I think that's something that's just, yeah, hard with PUBG because it's, it's a much more realistic looking game and there's blood and, you know, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not like it's graphic. It's not like Mortal Kombat graphic, yeah. but it's like Mortal Kombat's banned well, in yeah. like half the countries <laughs> out there. They don't give a fuck either. They keep, they keep putting those uh, fatalities out there, but yeah, I, this is a problem in general with, with shooting games. It's actually something I meant to ask Moses here, but the fact that these are games where people acquire realistic, like actual guns. Well, they're yeah. not actual guns, but guns that you could buy in real life. Uh, and they're killing each other with it, or especially in, in um, Counter-Strike, where it's terrorists versus counter-terrorists, which uh, as each year passes is more of a real Right, that's kind uh, of like a political thing, thing almost, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that can be problematic. I know, especially because um, the Olympics has been flirting with the idea of, of, of using various esports. It looks like they have something worked out with um, Street Fighter, because the Olympics are going to be in Tokyo oh, no coming up here. Yeah. Oh, there. I think we wanted it to be StarCraft, but if it was in Japan, they probably got to. Yeah, them first. It'd be we, a we did weird. some we did some stuff in Pyeongchang. Right, um, I remember that for the IOC. The Scarlet won that. Yeah, Scarlet won right? that one, and it was. Uh, they were saying it was it was a good model because it's not. There's nothing controversial about right, right. You know, aliens fighting. It's, it's like it's a chess game basically. And yeah, for like a modern chess type thing. Yeah, it's one of the advantages about StarCraft. Fortunately, um, is that it's not uh, a, a violent game that would bother people no or, it's or really there, there would be issues with getting sponsors or put it on tv yeah i mean that's what kind of is beautiful about starcraft that's another game that's also easy to understand like when you just kind yeah. of look at it you kind of get it you kind of are like okay there's these armies and okay these guys have like swords on their arms and they're gonna go run at the other guy and try to hit him and okay that's a tank everybody knows what a tank is yeah you just see one army kill another one you go okay i, I think i know who won yeah, yeah. exactly so um you've got some changes coming up for StarCraft this year, right? Like, so oh, I was yeah. just thinking about this because I wanted I wanted to pick your brain on this. I actually haven't seen you much since I got back to Korea because I was. I don't think anybody's seen me, man. I haven't <laughs> had any work in like two months. So I, I uh, no more than that. Let's see. I finished. Uh, I saw you I for like Blizz New Year's, and then like I haven't yeah, really seen and then you I, much. I went to Thailand, hung out there for a little bit, and well, I've uh, been casting a ton on Twitch. That's the real. Yeah, that, there's that that's too. I I have one cast tomorrow, so that'll um, by the time this is out, that will have already happened. That'll be my first cast back, and then um. GSL has not been announced, but you know th that'll get sorted out shortly here. Um, and then there's been a shift where Blizzard is no longer running WCS the same way it is. Uh, it's going to be moved over to ESL. I think it's it called the ESL Pro Tour, I think right? So. I, I think there was still some debate if they're going to keep it called WCS or not. But I think by the time this is out, we'll probably have a better idea. But um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird for us here because you know there was this massive firing at Blizzard, right? Um, and I kind of heard in advance there might be some people laid off, and that's not that's not abnormal. Yeah. In in, a, in any big company to have layoffs, there's always some degree of bloat. But I didn't expect it to be all the esports people. That was that was the big shock. And um, 
a lot of the people they they fired at Blizzard, um, or, or maybe didn't re-up their contract, whatever fancy way you, you want to say it, uh, were the people that I thought were very important. Um, so that was that was pretty that was pretty shocking. Right. Um, and since then. Uh, a lot of the other people that were involved have actually also quit. So it's like all the people that were there at Blizzard that were in charge of keeping the game around and, and uh, I guess micromanaging it, making important decisions, they're all gone. And instead, things have moved over to, uh, I think, more of like a free market environment. Sure. Um, this is kind of similar to what uh, you were I you was were just talking. thinking that. We're in very similar situations in a way. So, I mean, <sighs> Blizzard's relationship with StarCraft is really complicated because, and I think a lot of people that just followed StarCraft 2 might not be familiar with this, but, um, you know, when they put StarCraft 1 on TV out here in Korea, um, and it, it did very well, almost immediately, they didn't ask for Blizzard's permission and didn't give Blizzard any control. Right, when it was um, Caspa? It was Caspa, right. Um, and Blizzard wanted to have some control, and they were like, no, we're going to kind of push, push mm. you out of the picture. Um, so this was about 22 years ago, maybe maybe about 21 years ago, actually. Um, and so since then, this has sort of been like Blizzard's white whale, is we want to get back in and, and get control of this, because um, nothing's ever quite been as big as StarCraft One in Korea. Oh, it's I, I nuts. Mean, yeah, I mean, League, League obviously is huge, but like right when this happened, this is, this is crazy. You, you, hundreds of thousands of people would come to a single event. Yes, yes, it was, it was massive. And so uh, I think this is one of the reasons why they made StarCraft II to begin with, is they needed to get their own IP and then have control over it. And that's why you see a lot of features like you can't play on LAN because they want to have some control over their game. Um, uh, or they, they don't want people to be able to run a tournament. They want to have the power to, for instance, shut that down. It's also okay. for other reasons, like to, to make sure there's no bugs happening anywhere and, and, and to get proper statistics so that they know what's happening in their game. But then, it's, like, my question to you is, like, because yeah. you asked me this, is that, like, do you think that was a good idea by Blizzard in the long run? Like, well, was that the right decision? Well, so they wanted to... First of all, they were elbowed out of the way in StarCraft One, right? And I think even the WTO was involved. I think for a little bit there. Oh God, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of fighting, and you know the the Korean pro teams. They had major uh, Korean companies like Samsung and and uh, yeah. uh, SKT and, and other uh, companies were actually just frankly bigger than Blizzard. That were able to kind of take better control of the situation because they each sponsored a team. Um, so Blizzard came in here expecting with StarCraft Two to to a dominate. Um, and then B, to, to kind of push this into the global uh, realm because Korea, especially at that time, was super insular and not very good at promoting outside of their own borders. Um, but when they made StarCraft II, that's not, it's not like CSGO, right? CSGO is just an attempted improvement upon Counter-Strike right. Source, which was an attempted improvement uh, on, uh, on Counter-Strike 1.6. So um, while they got all this control, then they wanted to run everything. So that's where you end up with stuff like WCS. Initially, when the game came out, everybody was, uh, every little company was in charge of different uh, little tournaments, and they started to overlap. This is why I was mentioning or asking you earlier if, if that was causing market confusion, stuff like that. Um, and so Blizzard wanted to have that streamlined. The problem is, A, it takes a lot of people and a lot of money to do that. Um, and it seems like at the end, whether this was purely Blizzard's decision or more of Activision's uh, pressure over Blizzard because those companies are merged together and Activision has more uh, control than right. Blizzard does in, in, in that sense. Um, it it seems like they don't want to micromanage everything. I think this is and, the and, trend and, but, in but, esports. But, yeah, but they still want to have, like, I guess the licensing and, and, and they, they don't want to fully let go and have people just do whatever they want. Um, and so it going to ESL, I think it's in good hands there. Uh, a lot of people forget that everybody that worked at um, ESL and DreamHack basically came from two games. They came from StarCraft or Counter-Strike or, or maybe Quake. So it's kind of like they own like a theater, and you could, but you can rent out the theater for various events or whatever you want to do. And they still have the theater. Like They could still say, okay, you, know, you have to do it this way. We're going to do these I, things. Yeah, I but. think, think I'm going to have a better idea when I get to the events because then I, I kind of see what's happening. Like in the past, there would be a production company, and then there'd be sort of like... I don't, minders is probably not the, the right word, but there'd be Blizzard people there that would be that would say, okay, we want the logo to be brighter here, or we need to have a part. Oh yeah, or that. 
I don't know, maybe it references this other product. I don't know. It's it's all kind of complicated when you see it go down. Um, and then we'll we'll produce the show and, and, and put it on. But um, ESL is going to be in charge of it, and I think they have to try to, to profit off of it. So they're going to be more motivated to try to do this. Also, you know, one problem at Blizzard is that everybody was getting moved into Overwatch. Right. People keep getting pushed into that because there's this mammoth project um, that is so big it's not allowed to fail, I think, as far as the company is concerned. It can't. It can't. It's, it's too huge. There's it, so much money in it. There's so much money, uh, and so we're going to see what happens with that. But uh, a lot of people um, that I would work with were moved over to Overwatch, I saw, and it seems like... And this also was an issue with Heroes of the Storm and Hearthstone when they all were doing competitive esports, is yeah. that, okay, who does what game? What, what really matters and this is what's going to be really interesting about when riot starts to drop their games because so i've got some interesting stuff yeah that, that i've been hearing in the background about that yeah they're going to be hands off with, i've heard that with the from other stuff. places too they're yeah. tired like it, it's not it's so hard to run esports like yeah. it as it's having it like as a branch of your company is really challenging because there's all kinds of logistics that we've been like we've been talking about that yeah. go into it and there's decisions that have to be made and then you got to talk to the people above you like at the company like the the ceos and stuff and approve it with them and there's this all these problems so it's so much easier and i think for these companies to just say here you you know you have these third-party companies like esl or something like that where you can just say here just take it you know just we know we trust you enough that we know you're going to do a good job with yeah. it you guys take over this and you, you might then you can have a much smaller staff in your own company you can save money that way you're not you know dumping money into it as per in the sense that you're like using esports as an advertisement more than anything else whereas these companies are actually trying to run it make a yeah. profit well, this is one of the weird things about esports too, because people talk about how it doesn't make money, um, and then it, it, that's a very difficult thing to quantify. Right. Like, let's say they just stopped all StarCraft uh, to uh, esports. Like, I, I, I don't know how many people would want to play. How many people are playing because there are these tournaments going on that they can feed off kill of? Kill the game. I think it'd be pretty bad for it, for sure. I mean, in my head, I think it would kill the game, but I'm also so kind of sucked into the center of this. Well, look what happened with Heroes. Yeah, Heroes took a big blow. Took a big blow. And after the weird, they got the weird thing is, people say uh, at times esports doesn't make money, but again, it's it's difficult to quantify what the presence of these tournaments yeah. actually does in the long run for the game. It's it's it is an advertisement. I, I said that in a little bit of a joking way, but it actually is, it, uh, among other things, an advertisement for your game, showing that look at this. Look at if you play this game enough, if you get good enough at this game, you can make you know X amount of dollars. You'll be famous. You'll be you know you get to play video games for a living, and you know uh, what you know what fifteen year old boy doesn't go look at that and go ooh, yeah. I want to do that. You know, I mean, it's just. And so, like, I mean, that's what we, that's where you and I came from. You know, that's what we wanted to do. We oh, wanted yeah. to chase being in esports, you know, professional in some manner or another. And eventually yeah. we ended up here. I think the fact that, like, for 15 year old tasteless, the fact that there was some kind of uh, place where the very best people played and you could watch them was a, a huge motivating factor for me to kind of, I mean, devote myself to learning the game and, and trying to improve on it. Um, so, it, yeah, it seems like there needs to be something. Uh, like that somewhere. Just to go back for a second with the the, the Starcraft thing. Oh I th yeah. I know. I, th I think it's in. I think it's in a good spot. Um, we'll just have to see. You know, as the year goes on, I I'm still pretty optimistic for Starcraft uh, overall. Yeah. The uh, viewership slowly just keeps going up. Every time I watch, there's, yeah, there's very, more people. Very, like very a little, little bit. bit. Yeah. It's it's got a very sustainable uh, amount of viewers with uh, almost no advertising at all. People just come and find it. But uh, I'm more worried about Blizzard as a as a company, mm. uh, as a whole, because. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I I always assumed was constant when I started this was was Blizzard, right? Right. Uh, um, Mike Morheim was a big supporter of StarCraft. Uh, they, that guy loved esports. Yeah, he loved esports, and also they were very um, very good to each of their games, which was what made them different from a lot of other uh, AAA publishers. Is usually. Um, a publisher, m most other AAA publishers, it's a very linear direction the game, the, the company's going in, and so all the older games are kind of falling off the back. Right. And then it's just whatever's here in this periphery, and then, you know, that eventually gets put away. But Blizzard would basically, it's like they're planting a garden, and they want to keep it alive. And that was one of the things that made um, 
them as a game company very enticing to want to get into their games because you knew there was always an ecosystem where uh, everything was safe. Now, uh, that being said, I think the decision for them to give it to ESL, um, uh, give WCS to them, right? we still don't know what it's called yet, but <laughs> uh, whatever it is, it's the same thing as WCS, basically. If we say WCS, people yeah, know. Yeah, people like, know. Um, uh, th th that decision was intended to keep the game healthy and, and in a good spot. But I, I just worry about Blizzard overall. I mean, the, them killing Heroes of the Storm was, was pretty pretty fucking crazy that was nuts um, dude yeah and that then, was a that was a crazy day here uh, yeah well because people always assume that everything they do is, is permanent and i think um we're gonna have to see what happens i think we'll have a better idea with the release of their next few games does diablo 4 do well uh the cell phone thing they seem to be in a real bind with in general that um, one's hard man mobile games make so much money you know yeah. what the most the most profitable game in the world is right now um pubg mobile pubg mobile pubg mobile that's not made by nope it's 10 cent uh, how is that possible? They, I don't know exactly how this all works. How worked. is it possible? We're not allowed to like mention each other's games when we talk, like when we're on broadcast. What? We are specifically told, like when I do, I do, I do. So both, when you do right? PUBG Mobile, do you have to call? It, yeah, you do like PUBG Mobile, like yes. that. Yes, you can't okay. just call it PUBG. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot just call it PUBG. Okay, you it and. You call it PUBG Mobile. That is that is exactly really? the name that you have to call it. One hundred percent. PUBG on a phone. <laughs> you can't just say. Wait, is there a is there a client on on a PC for like PUBG Mobile? You know, some games you, you can get oh, like the client. Oh, I'm sure you could do that. There's okay. like those like there's like Android. They have to play on a like, phone when they do that. Uh, what right? do you call them? Emulators. Yeah. So there's like an Android emulator emulator or yeah. something like that, and you can get PUBG on there. So you could totally play. What a lot of players do is there's like little devices you can put on your phone that have like joysticks and like pads on the top. So you're basically making your phone into a controller, and so you can play it that way. Is that how they do it at tournaments? No, at tournaments you're not allowed to use anything. Just what? the phone. Just the phone. And is there use, a certain kind of phone yeah, you have use, to use? They use uh, this one, the Galaxy Note S10 Plus. Uh, so you can't Samsung, use it on an iPhone? There you go. There's an advertisement. You can't, you you can't cannot, do it on an iPhone? We'll get some counter no, phone No, Samsung server? or somebody. Not Samsung has sponsored some events for it. They didn't sponsor the one I did in Saudi Arabia, which I want to talk about that a little bit sometime. But Yeah, uh, yeah let's talk about that in a minute. Yeah, I, just, yeah. I, I want to pick your brain on this. this uh, so PUBG Mobile, the, yeah. So is, you can't talk about the other... Correct. I can't compare them. You, so you, But I mean... You, to me, it would seem like that would, if you play PUBG, then, okay, when you're on the train or you're yeah, somewhere you where you're not Mobile. your desk, you play PUBG Mobile. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. And yeah. Like, I mean, PUBG Mobile games are great. It's, they're almost, I, like, PUBG Mobile is very, very similar. And you cast I don't both, say, right? I cast both, yeah. Um, they're almost, like, the guns are all the same. The, the maps are basically the same. Now, PUBG Mobile does have something that I find interesting that I'm kind of wondering if PUBG is going to try. More of, a, like, a Counter-Strike style system. Were you, were you told that at every event that you can't say PUBG? Yes. At, at every event? Well, every, once in a while, every PUBG I'll, Mobile event, they make it very clear because they know I'm a PUBG caster. Like, that's oh, kind really? of... Oh, really? Okay. They make it very clear to me. Make sure you say PUBG Mobile. Because sometimes I've done events where people tell me that I, like, shouldn't say... Like this or that it's always somebody who like doesn't really have a job and they're trying to like make make up like some important thing they do which is like yeah. to try to well it's yeah. just there is like there is PUBG Mobile and PUBG are still related in some way like there's still some kind of interconnection but yeah but PUBG is um, it used to be Blue Hole now it's a different I can't even remember they rebranded yeah. um, and then Tencent exclusively does PUBG Mobile. They just literally took PUBG, turned it into a mobile game at first. And then as time's gone on, as time has gone on, there's been some changes like they have a ton more cosmetics for example. That but, like the amount of cosmetics in PUBG Mobile are out of control. Like it's you can actually like just like look like an Easter bunny and other do you, things. Like, do, you, do you think it deters from the 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 game or is it is it good with the cosmetics and everything? No, I think it's fine. I don't I mean like like really serious players like on PC the problem is is like the problem on PC becomes as a serious player, you're going to wear certain outfits that make you blend in better with the background. And what oh, players sure. actually, like professional players actually do, there's this thing called digital vibrance that you can mess with on, like, on your screen. I think it's like a setting in NVIDIA, like, graphics cards and stuff yeah. and, and probably AMD as well so you turn this jack this vibrance up and your screen looks like you're in like Willy Wonka chocolate factory but it oh, lets really? you see contrast between certain colors easier so it's easier to see players so you watch like if you watch so like when I do and, that, and that's legal in tournaments so it looks yeah, all totally. psychedelic yeah you're allowed to jack up like they lick the back of a frog in the Amazon <laughs> and now they're that's exactly what it looks yeah. like. Like players will be like, it's really funny when I was doing the PKL on my own yeah. stream, 
people would be like, what's with those weird color settings? Like, what's going on? And I'm like, no, yeah. no, no. They're showing a live what the player is seeing. Oh, like, wow. this is what it looks like. And so it became a trend in Korea to wear, uh, we call them banana suits. They're just like this yellow, this all yellow outfit, this like Bruce Lee looking thing. And because it meshed well when the when they turned the digital vibrance up, it, that yellow was a little harder to spot. There wasn't as much contrast with it, so people started wearing that. Now, now, PUBG so everybody's Corp- trying to play with Predator Vision on. <laughs> yeah, that's and exactly. Then, <laughs> that's and literally then what it yellow. is. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, you cover yourself in mud too and stuff. But wow. like, it's okay. um, uh, so so there's like, but on PUBG Mobile, like it doesn't matter. It's, yeah. It, most of the people that are playing it are playing it in third person anyway, so it's kind of and like you can't see as far. Yeah. For example, in PUBG, like if you turn on the view distance, like you can see for like a kilometer. Yeah. Right. I think it might be even be longer than that if you put it on ultra, but I, I know it's at least a kilometer because like players get like kills sometimes that are like 900 meters, and you're like, what the fuck. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so what PUBG is doing now, actually at the PUBG Global Championship, they just made them all wear the exact same thing. That's probably a better, combat better move. It, yeah, because yeah, then, because like, there was problems, like uh, there was an event. It was called the MET. Uh, it was one of the big PUBG classics. It was the only one I didn't do this year because it was done by a Thai, a Thai company, and they opted to go with um, Thai people for their English casting, which was a disaster. That happens sometimes. <laughs> which yep. was an absolute disaster, to be honest. Um, but. So I didn't get to do that one, but I was watching it, of course, from home, and people were claiming that the Korean teams were cheating because they were all wearing the same outfit. They were all wearing these yellow banana suits. Well, people didn't realize that they had already been doing this for a long time, and other regions hadn't like figured out the oh, reason. Oh, really? Oh, so yeah. this is one of these things where, yeah, some so part of the world's figured the Korean this teams out. are cheating, yeah. but they're not. They're just, these are what they wear. Because they think it blends in the best, especially on Miramar, which is the sand map. That yellow really blends in well with most of that map. So, like, they were, you know, people just, you know, erroneously attribute this to them, you know, collaborating or whatever, colluding or whatever you want to call it. So, let's talk about you going to Saudi Arabia. Um, you've been to many places now. Oh, God. Um, I traveled so much. Been, I was out of Korea for, road. like, three months total this um, year. You were out of the three months total? Like three months total, everything? I wow. was not in Korea. Uh, I, when I was interviewing Moses, I had no idea how much CSGO casters travel. Like, I knew there was always an event going on. Um, and, it, and it seemed like every time I would go on Twitch, I would see something happening. And I'd think, oh, I must have caught. Oh, their viewership the, numbers are great. Their viewership numbers are, are killing it. But um, uh, one of the things he was complaining about is that he's just, there's like no end. He just lives. Just lives in a suitcase, uh-huh. right? Yeah, he lives out of a suitcase, and he's always on the road. And well, this is Kalaris's life too. That guy yeah. gets so much work because he's so fucking good. This is one of the reasons why I like being out here. Yeah, he's no, he's a fucking great host. But yes, I, I need to have like periods where I'm just at home. Yes, I mean in this case, home being in Korea, but I need to like actually. Not. Yeah, I really want to go to Evo Japan, for example, because yeah. some people I know are going. Yeah. But I'm just like, I don't want to get on a plane. I just want to stay at home. Yeah, you want to? I'm a little burnt out. So, w- which places did you go this year? You went to... Uh, oh, God. Uh, so, I went to... Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, Moscow. Moscow. Thailand. China, like, two times, two or three times. China. You, we were in Xi'an together. Yeah, Xi'an, London. yeah, we did Xi'an together. London. There was somewhere else. Well, America for the PUBG Global Championship. Damn. So, I was all over the world. I literally went all the way around the world uh, in yeah. November. I started here in Korea, went to America, then visited my friends and family around America some, and then flew to Saudi Arabia, and then Saudi Arabia back to Korea. So, so went all the way around the planet. What is Saudi Arabia like? Because that's one of those um, places where they, there's an event, and it's like, so yeah, I would never be flying from Seoul to Saudi Arabia for fun. So what? I got, yeah, I got to go to a couple countries that people like just don't get to go to. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia just recently kind of has started to loosen up a lot of their laws and restrictions, like women yeah. can drive now, and yeah. um, they don't have to wear the full burqa anymore. They right. still have to wear the hijab, I think it's called, the thing on their I, head. Yeah, I think it's called the hijab. And yeah. As long as their arms and legs are covered, they can. It's fine. They can show their face and other things now. So it's like they're starting to modernize or westernize. I guess would be a better way to put it. I've heard they're banking on having tourists down the road. They're going to try to that's make exactly it a tourist what they want. hub. Yeah. But, so that's but you why can't, you can't drink and you, you can't, can't drink. gamble. There's no alcohol. And you can't. Yeah, none. Right. None. It's just. It's not even like Dubai where it's like legal in the. You got to go to a hotel, and, right? Yeah. yeah. And like you some pay other. Sixteen dollars for a Heineken and. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, You're drunk in a hotel lobby, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah, what everybody's dream is. Um, so, 
Saudi Arabia, first of all, yeah, it's like within the last year or two, they've opened it up where tourists that are like not there for religious reasons can go. But I, as, as a question, then what, what is the thing people go there for? I mean, is, is, is there like a big... Um, There's a lot of cultural stuff. It's, yeah, a lot of history. I, yeah, a lot of history there. Um, it's, it's beautiful in a way. Like if you've never been to a desert, and I never had. That was actually my first time in like a desert. Oh, wow. Okay. And... I found it to be quite interesting in that respect. Like, I'd never seen a landscape kind of like that. Their architecture is quite interesting and beautiful. Yeah. Um, the people are incredibly nice. Some of the nicest people I have ever met in my life. Like, they they will give you the shirt off their back. And I mean that almost literally. I was I had to take uh, an Uber to go do a little sightseeing with uh, another caster, Valdez. And uh, we were there together. And so we wanted to go do a little sightseeing. And so we went to the desk. And there was this Saudi Arabian woman working there. Very nice. And she's like, what do you guys need? Do you need help? And I'm like, yeah, we're trying to go to, like, some cultural stuff. Can you recommend some things? She's like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So she gives us a few places to go to which ended up being weird but i'll get into that and so she's like yeah i'll call you guys an uber no problem i'm like okay great and then uh, like i kind of didn't process everything and like two right, minutes later that would mean she's paying for the uber right yeah two minutes later i'm like oh my gosh i don't have any cash like can i get you the money and she's like no no no. here you could just pay for the uber with cash and she gives me like 15 dollars in saudi arabian cash and i'm just Damn. like can i pay you back like no she's like no no, no it's fine don't worry about it and I'm like, no, no, no. Damn, like, that's baller. I know. It was super nice. Wow. And, I, and everybody, like, the Saudi Arabian casters were just some of the nicest dudes. They were buying us, like, donuts and pizza and stuff. And everybody there was out going out of their way to show you a good time because I think they really – their I think government is, like, kind of pushing this idea of it being a tourist that, place. I think they probably just don't get that many – They all speak English, too. Tourists, Like, really. everybody. Isn't it weird what places people speak English and what places people don't speak English? Yeah. Because it doesn't seem to ever be in line with education rates or... It's not. Or anything like that, you know, it's... I mean, I, you, you can meet homeless people in the Philippines or English is fine, <laughs> you know, it's... But other places you go, no. You go it's to Japan, weird. it's very difficult Japan, to find people Japan, yeah, not that many speak people English. speak English yeah. in Japan. Which is why I'm, like, glad I learned Japanese. I studied Japanese for, like, a year. I can at least get by when I'm there. Yeah. You know, obviously, I wanted to go there, which is why I studied it. But now, right. like, I, now that I live so close, it's like yeah. a two-hour flight, right? Right from here, right. Very to Japan, close. and I love going there. It's a beautiful country, and um, and the foods, all the foods, amazing, and everything's great there. But yeah, Saudi Arabia. Um, so outside of the people being incredibly nice, it was dusty, like because there's sand everywhere. The inside of our event, our venue, was just filled with dust. Really, I mean, you could see it. I have pictures. I'll show you. You could just see the dust in the air, and I could taste it on my like lips. In my mouth. Oh, really? Yeah, it's almost like because I was at the beach uh, for Christmas, but yeah, th th you can just get sand and everything everywhere. Yeah, and then like our you know our PGMs, our monitors where we mm -hmm. have the game and stuff will get dusty. We had to periodically wipe them off because they were getting so much dust or sand essentially from the air on top of them. And so like <laughs> it's pretty funny. I told I told one of the Saudi casters, I'm like, they really need to like close the doors because they had these huge like garage doors that you could like fit a truck in right because this yeah. venue is like this is another interesting thing about saudi arabia is they told me once this event was done they were destroying this building and then rebuilding it this is like how they kind of keep their economy moving i think that this is something china seems to do china does this. as well where they're just constantly you're just building under it's construction an Asian thing too yeah yeah i don't know I, I don't quite understand the economics of it but it seems to be something that Gives people jobs, I guess. Gives people jobs, because I know we did WCG. That building had just been built. Like, they got the electricity plugged in there the yeah. day before, and they might tear it down again or something. Right. So, like, while I was there, they were constantly doing work on this building. So, they had these huge garage door open that were open, and trucks and people and stuff were coming in and out quite often, and sand was coming in because of this. And so... I, I said to one of the Saudi casters, I'm like, they really need to close these doors. Like, the dust is horrible in here. He's like, no, 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 we open them so it gets better. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like, no, that's not, that's not how this works. Like, I, if you've ever been in a city that has, like, a pollution problem, kind of like Seoul does. Yeah. Uh, no, that's the you're opposite better inside, no we, matter we need what. always, yeah, be indoors with Even air purifiers. Even if you don't have an air purifier. Even if you don't have an air purifier, it's much better indoors. Yeah. So I was just kind of like, uh, yeah, okay, well, all right. Do, do you know, is, is there going to be other events in other places that I think, I guess, people like you and me might deem more obscure or, or unexpected for, for gaming? Oh, yeah. Because when I was in Thailand um, for the holidays, I saw PUBG Mobile all over the place. It's everywhere. It's just Southeast it Asia everywhere. and India, it's huge. Yeah. Um, I've heard it's growing in Africa. 
Uh, I mean, is there going to be a chance that you're going to be going to uh, more regions like that? Because, you know, people talk shit on phones and they're kind of right in that people are always looking at their phones. They're always staring down. Uh, it can be really antisocial if you're in a restaurant and everybody's looking at their phones. But, you know, if you got like, if you have like a really garbage job, like you're a guy that sits, you know, in floor one of a building, you're like oh, a door guy or yeah. something. You basically just sit there all day in case something happens. A phone is like the greatest thing ever. Like I had so many just terrible jobs as, as a kid. Like I worked in a candy store that almost nobody came into, but I wasn't allowed to like use a laptop or read a book. So I kind of like stood there and did nothing, did nothing and was like trapped in my own it's thoughts horrible. all day. But if I had a phone, it would have made it much better. But you know, most people who are out, <coughs> excuse me, most people who are out um, at their jobs and there's a lot of just downtime. It seems like having a game to play on your phone is the greatest savior of, yeah. of your time and it gives you something to do, something to compete in. I didn't is, expect it to become as big as it has, if that makes sense. Is is the esports thing a little bit artificial or, or is there no. you think there's a real drive for competition? No, there's a huge Are there drive. like do not fuck around cell phone guys mm -hmm. showing up to this? One hundred percent. I mean the PUBG mobile players, like their game is more popular, like in terms of not just people who play it, but also viewership. Yeah. PUBG Mobile has a great viewership, especially especially in like Southeast Asia and that area. It's huge there. China, yeah. it's huge. But it, this, this makes sense, though. I mean, if you don't... Not everybody has a desktop or, or, or a 4K TV um, that they can just plug a console into <sighs> and, and play a game. But at this point in time, it seems like everybody does need a smartphone. You have to. And, so, and they're cheap. They're cheap computers, right? People don't think about this. These are computers. These things are yeah. computers. That's literally what these are. And so you can do anything you can do on a Sorry, computer, what? basically. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what? No, this guy computers. just sold me on cell phones. There, what? <laughs> no, like they're computers in your pocket, yeah. right? They yeah. have the, everything. They have graphics cards. They have you know CPUs. They have everything. And so why not? Why why wouldn't they? Like I, I never occurred, of course, because we're like no, I did. Yeah, it doesn't occur to me. Yeah. Stuff, and I was kind of like, oh yeah. yeah. And then I started playing <laughs> for other Clash people. Real. It's just a porn machine that makes phone calls. Calls, but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, when I started playing Clash Royale like years yeah. ago, it's when I kind of thought, okay, maybe there's something here. Like, yeah, I, I had this with Hearthstone where I went, oh, actually, now I can play something competitive. Like while I'm on the train going to to cast GSL, I actually can. There's a way I can really engage somebody um, and compete while doing something totally outdoors. Hey, okay, here's a question then. Um, you've seen. Um, you know the Stadia? Stadia? Do you know a Stadia? I called it, call it the Stadia. I don't know what this it's, is. It's um, it's Google. It's, it was making like a console, but it's like a, it's not a console. It streams onto any device, so like a monitor. Oh, kind of or like a, a Chromecast kind of thing. Yeah, it'd be like Chromecast, but for a game. Oh. Um, and I, I and one of the big cells. Now, apparently, the thing's doing terribly, but I think it's because of the technology to get the thing to stream onto a game from somewhere else to stream onto. Uh, like like your laptop or just a screen or your phone. It's it's not quite there yet, but okay. Uh, presumably, we will have that technology in a couple of years. Um, is that going to make cell phone games obsolete? Because we'll just be able to play like like if I take my phone here, right? So I got my phone. Let's say I can play any game that I could normally play um, on a on a controller. Like let's say it's Halo. This is probably a better example. But, yeah. But instead of um, having to get a, a, a cell phone game that I get in the app store, I just turn this on and I'm playing Halo here. Is that going to make games like PUBG Mobile obsolete? Because we can just get... I don't know, maybe. This is this might be the new thing that... This is something I actually didn't know about. Yeah, uh, I knew very little uh, about it. Maybe the last two weeks I've, I've figured, I've, I've learned some stuff about it. I try not to keep up too much with some technology stuff because a lot of times it turns out to not happen or not be the case or right so you never know you know well, what i'm still direction. curious about this vr thing yeah I don't there's know. some vr esports e stuff that's cropping up now and i'm really yeah, curious I don't, if that's... I, i'm very suspicious about that I, I would be curious to see how it goes but vr i guess we'll have to see when the half-life vr game comes out that'll be <sighs> the first big budget i'm gonna get that shit i'm gonna get that 100 percent. i'm gonna, I'm get, gonna that. get that are shit. you kidding like i, I want to see what that's all about that but, looks super fun but um is there a possibility that like we have a situation where people are making games designed for very very tiny screens that can yeah. then just be played everywhere 
100%. I mean, and mobile games are the most profitable games. You make a mobile game, you make a killing. This is why Blizzard and other companies want to get into this market yeah. because it's nuts. It, they make they make money and they don't even have to try. Like, I give I give Clash Royale five but, bucks a month to but, play their stupid game because, and I don't have to. It's but free. But don't some of these games, don't they make money in part because of degenerate behavior, right? I mean, <laughs> it's just, no, seriously. Like, some of these games are geared towards people with, with problems with their fucking brain and they just spend all their money on stupid shit that like like fucking yes. you know what I'm talking about. No, yeah. I, am, I, yeah. I am that person sometimes. I mean, I buy buy cosmetics Yeah, I mean, I buy that shit sometimes too, but like, you know what I'm talking yes, about, right? Yes. Like, well, there are people who spend like all their yeah. earned money on these yeah. things. Like they, yeah. they are, they're called whales, right? Yeah, you, yeah. You just spend fucking all fucking morons, this. yeah, but whatever. <laughs> but they're, they're, they just spend all their money at, like to get all the hats and a... Yeah. A game. I mean, there's like, yeah. I know, okay, so this is funny. I have a story yeah. about this. Yeah. When I was in Saudi Arabia, I was talking to the Saudi casters and yeah. like, I so bet a they had all the, the shit, right? A Did couple they have of like the yeah. rich Saudi people they know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they're princes or not, but it, there's so many princes actually. It's like kind of yeah, weird. It's not even cool. It's yeah, like, it's, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. they were saying that their friend uh, had two PUBG mobile accounts that had every single cosmetic unlocked. Damn. Now, how much do you think? It would cost you to unlock every single cosmetic in PUBG Mobile. So this is, you want me to actually guess? I want this? you to guess. Every single cosmetic. Every single one. Um, a hundred thousand dollars more. Really? Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Two hundred fifty. A quarter of a million. Ish. Ish. Is what I was told. I don't know. I can't verify that. Damn. This is what I was told. So this dude dropped half a million dollars on this game. Damn. Just so he could have. And this everything. is why my opinion is not that important. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Wow. I mean, this is, this is how these games make money, right? And then there's us. There's people like me. I spend $5 a month to get the Clash Royale League Pass because it's like got yeah. some nice benefits to it. It's actually worth it to me. Yeah. And I uh, obviously, I cast the game too. But right. you could just, yeah, degenerates just sit there and just throw money at these things. So is that, is that I mean, I, I don't know what the answer is. Is that good because it gives them so much money they can try to fund their esports? Or is that bad because it... It, uh, I don't know, sullies the, the, the game or, 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 you know, some of these people that spend money on this or not. Now, I'm actually not really in the business of trying to, like, protect people from themselves and stuff. But, yeah, uh, I guess I guess the argument would probably be better if it's a if it's a pay to win model. Right. Any game that's pay to win is, is essentially problematic. Right. Because yeah. it's no longer really a game. It's like. And PUBG Mobile, um, there's none of that. I don't know what it is. I mean, that, yeah. that's the cool thing about something like PUBG yeah. Mobile. There's none of that, really. It's all just cosmetic. Yeah. So I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I get that. It, like, yeah, there are people who have like obsessive behaviors, and because of that, are going to spend too much money or like steal yeah. their parents' credit card and you know buy like a, you know hundreds of dollars of stuff in it. Yeah. Which is of course problematic, but at the same time, like yeah, it's good. It's good. I think it's good for esports because they're trying and they're like the mobile games are becoming more and more popular because they're the phones are cheaper right these computers are cheaper yeah. than a computer that you put on your desk like yeah. the, the the price it costs to get a computer that can run PUBG really well is high and the, the the cost that can get a phone that can run PUBG Mobile is not you can get PUBG Mobile to run i got it to run on my Samsung Galaxy 5 which is like That's which is old, like right? an old phone yeah. and it worked just fine damn well, what do you think is going to be next for, for phone games then? Is there, because I'll be honest, I think most people would agree with me that first person shooters is not exactly the, the, the most ideal, ideal vehicle for this. Is there a, is there a you know, we, we've seen, for instance, auto chess games get really big, um, and that kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, CCGs are still are obviously big. People are trying to push into new ones. It seems like Hearthstone. Um, you know, talk about a game. I think I've spent a lot of money in the past playing. <laughs> I know you. Have. I was a whale in that game. Um, I spent a lot of money on cards in that, but it seems like that might be declining slightly. Is so obviously card games have done well on phone uh, phones. Auto chess seems to be doing fine. Uh, PUBG Mobile does very very well, extremely well, which is very impressive because I think a lot of people didn't think that would be good. It also gives some hope for games like Diablo Immortal. Maybe that actually is really playable on a phone. Yeah, I, I think, think it, I think it probably will be. I think. Oh, I think it'll be fine. I think it's just that PC gamers. I think logic would be disgusted by a PC game company making a phone game, especially for a big franchise like Diablo. Yeah. Um, let me digress there. Sure. I, I, what I was trying to get at is, is there like a type of game that can be made on phone that could be the next big thing? I can't think of anything that couldn't at this point. I'm, really? I'm, I'm convinced that anything you can do on a computer, you can do on a phone. Fighting You'll game. Find can you do a fighting game? Hell yeah. There are fighting Damn, games okay. on phones. Are they good? Yeah. 
We're, in the <laughs> we're like, we're surrounded by fighting game <laughs> yeah, nerds. I'm like, guys, like, <laughs> you tell me, is it any good? Like, I, I've seen them. I think, I think there's potential where it could be good. I mean, the I thing guess is those screens are really could... sensitive, so you could have like six buttons, you know, no problem. And like Gerald's like, <laughs> <laughs> <in the> <laughs> um, I would do it. I'd try it. Oh, I mean, I'll try it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try any game. It's it's not a it's not a bad idea. Um. But I think cool. I don't think there's any limits anymore. Now that you can do first-person shooters on phones really okay, relatively so well. Before we close, what about VR? Is that going to be? Is it, can you have a, a competitive VR game? I want it. Can to you be. get a VR headset that doesn't make everybody sick? Yeah, they have those. They now. have those now. Yeah, because I I tried some of the old ones and I was. You, we could go down. I was and, not we go down okay. to a VR room here in Korea and try them. No, I tried one. It was an old VR room. Oh, I mean, the, I don't know the head. It was it was. A, was it bad? Oh, okay. Yeah, it was bad. I, that's why I've I, heard the new ones are fine. Really? Like, I want to play, like, personally, I want to do, um, like, flight sims or, like, X-Wing stuff. Like, I'm going to, like, you I'm going like, to cast in cast in VR. I want to oh. see Clinton, the VR it's caster. Like, you're fucking that. flying through the game. You got your wands and shit, and you're fucking <laughs> zooming around like Superman. That would be pretty That'd be fun. cool. That would be pretty cool. Like, and you like you have like a virtual caster desk, and you're sitting there, and you like look over, and there's like your I'm, I'm on one of those and... treadmills that moves any direction. I got my gloves on and stuff. So I'm in well, a they, Starcraft battle happening all around me. They did a, a VR tournament here. I think it was Spo TV um, or VSPN. I can't remember which one, but they did. Uh, my hands. My hand is not going to this camera shot, is it? Are we okay? You okay? Okay, we're good. All right. All right. I just realized I've had my hand out the whole time. No, so, no, no, no. Yeah. so there was... I'm going to draw a Clinton puppet on my hand and make it talk like this. And like, Sorry, go ahead. I'm pushing your hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was a VR tournament uh, for... It's like a it's like a real-time strategy game for VR. So like oh, they had that at WCG. And you're like picking up stuff and like doing stuff. Yeah. I don't fully understand it, but I watched it and I was like, huh. That's kind of cool. Like I would, yeah. I kind of want to do that. And then like I've seen like the realistic like first-person shooters in VR and they look super fun. I yeah. mean, they're... It, it's it's almost too much though. Like when I, I watch it and I think about having that VR set in my head, and then I get shot. Like that's almost like jarring. Like I'm like, ooh. I want to play a survival horror game on VR. Oh God, you you're crazy. I want to. I I really like. I think because survival horror games are the one. I can't game where when I when I beat it as, as you know single player, I really feel like I've overcome something. Unless it's like Dark Souls, but that's like a challenge, you know? But like when I'm like, whoa, okay, I got out of there in one piece. That'd be cool. Um, we are actually at a little bit over an hour. Um, okay. Thank you for doing. Of course. My pleasure. The first video episode. My pleasure. Thank Thanks you, for everybody. having me, man. We're going to go yeah, to the after show. This is show. cool. This is great. Yeah, this was, this this was, was great. Nice this nice setup. This yeah, table great. is like sick, actually. Yeah, <laughs> this is really cool. So um, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, we're going to go to the after show now for... Patreon only Woo. supporters. Um, this is where you get the juicy stuff. That's right. Uh, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is the first of many. I will be going home now, packing my bags, and getting ready to go to Tokyo for Evo. Again, if you want to support us, patreon.com forward slash tasteless podcast. A little bit of money from you goes a long way for us in producing this show. This podcast was produced by State and Core A Studios. Artwork by Alaris. Music by Mark Lentz. Special thanks to our top Patreon supporters, Seth N., Rohit Somebody, John Kernicki, and Charlie Sheever. 